for it. Uh, we're going to be short on introductions today because we all know each other and we're all friends. So to start the day in our first plenary, Dan Sewell. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but seriously, Sid, that was wonderful. And I'm really glad that we started with such a great way to remember so many important people. And, and it was really well done. So thank you. I also want to thank Pat and Sid and the other members of the organizing committee for inviting me to be a part of today's program. Um, as you can see here, I'm going to be doing the opening plenary. And uh, th the focus of my talk is really going to be uh, our educational programs, past, present, and future. Um, you know, I think as educators, um, we give a lot. We give a lot of our time, our energy, our compassion, our creativity to the work that we do. And I think um, we also try to really share what we know. And I have a couple of slides that I'm going to start with that uh, contain two quotes. And I looked at these again this morning, and I realized something is missing. And that is, it's not just about that we give when we teach. It's about that we receive. And so I apologize that my, my quotes this morning don't really capture that aspect of what we do as educators. But clearly, I think the rewards of what we do are great, and they, they inspire us to do what we do. So we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. This is a paraphrase of Winston Churchill. He didn't actually say these words exactly, but he is credited with per, uh, conveying this idea forward in time, and I think it's uh, pretty meaningful. But uh, Yoda also gave us who mentor great advice, and I thank Nancy if she's in the audience because this uh, photo was uh, given to me via Nancy Downs, but always pass on what you have learned. I think that's really the mantra of those of us involved in the mentoring process. So I'm going to start my talk today by just trying to put into context where we were as a culture uh, and as a department back in 1969. We'll talk specifically about what was going on in terms of our educational effort in 1969, and then I'm going to flash forward to where we are today. And I, it's breathtaking, I think, how much we've grown in terms of this dimension of our mission as a department. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, where the future may be headed, and I'm, I've been fortunate enough to get a quote from uh, the director of our Psychiatry Education and Training Committee, and I'll be sharing his vision of where he thinks we will be going forward with our educational mission, and I'm referencing Neil, Neil Swardlow. Um, and then if there's time, I'm going to spend some time talking about some of the key concepts that we have passed forward to our learners over the decades that we've been engaged in educating future mental health professionals. So I'm not going to go way back to the dawn of psychiatry as I put things in educational context, um, but I am going to start with 1969. And uh, I hope that you enjoy some of what I've uncovered about what life was like back in 1969. What Sean is putting on now is actually the top song of the year in 1969. I remember this song. I'm not sure all of you in the audience may remember this song, uh, but I'm going to let it play a few more notes before I begin. It's Aquarius. <laughs> so in 1969, the world population was about 3.6 billion. In that year, Richard Nixon was inaugurated as our 37th president. Another significant event, particularly for people like me, was that it was the year that the Stonewall Riot occurred, which is often credited as being the beginning of the gay rights movement. Senator Edward Kennedy pled guilty for leaving the scene of an accident uh, at Chappaquiddick, and boy, was that a big media story back then, rightly so. Um, that was the year that we landed on the moon, and Neil Armstrong and uh, Buzz Aldrin actually walked on the surface of the moon, and as uh, Neil Armstrong took that first step, he made the famous quote, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What a day that was. What a remarkable moment in the history of the world. 1969 was the year that the FCC banned advertising regarding cigarettes. Uh, which we now kind of take for granted, although I noticed that the vape industry now has found its way onto the TV networks with some ads. Uh, it was also a time of great political unrest. Um, 
for instance, in October of that year, there was a huge nationwide demonstration about Vietnam War policies, and there were protesters in support of those policies and protesters who were vehemently against uh, those policies. Back in 1969, you could buy a newspaper for a dime, or you could buy a can of Campbell's soup for a dime. Um, that was the year that battery-powered smoke detectors were patented, and now, of course, we have those throughout all of our homes. The top television shows were, number one, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, um, Gunsmoke, Bonanza, Mayberry RFD, and Family Affair. Big movies that came out that year included Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Midnight Cowboy, and Valley of the Dolls. And as you heard, the top song was Aquarius, Let the Sun Shine In by the Fifth Dimension. Also, it was the year of Woodstock. And in August of that year, over a half million people gathered near Woods, uh, Woodstock, New York, upstate New York, for four days of rain, sex, drugs, and music, with some of the most important performers of the era participating, including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Joan Baez, The Who, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, Jefferson Airplane, and Sly, and The Family Stone. Now, I happen to know that somebody in the audience was at Woodstock. Um, anyone else in the audience want to raise their hand and acknowledge that? Well, Jim Santoro, my husband, was at Woodstock, <laughs> and uh, it's fun to hear him tell the stories about uh, what went on that day that he was there. We didn't have airport security screening uh, back in 1969, so we probably wouldn't have uh, heard our patients complain about the impact of that on their dreams when they have dreams about flying. A year before, DSM-2 had been published, uh, and it was an effort, uh, as all of the DSMs have subsequently been, to kind of correct some of what were identified as the deficiencies in the preceding volume of the DSM. Uh, DSM-2 was heavily influenced by Freudian principles, uh, even though at that time those principles were beginning to lose popularity. Um, they actually expanded uh, the number of uh, diagnoses in the DSM-2, and it was kind of controversial. It reminds me of some of the work that my geriatric psychiatry fellow, Awis Aftab, has been conduct conducting about how we define mental illnesses, because one of the things that happened with DSM-2 is a lot of things that we probably, in this day and age, wouldn't recognize as an illness were included. And there was some cynicism about that, and there was some thinking that these diagnoses were added in so that psychiatrists would have more business. Um, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that's some of what's been written about the DSM-2. And uh, the number of diagnostic categories was increased as well. Deinstitutionalization was well underway in 1969. It had really gotten started about 10 years earlier, but certainly uh, we were in the midst of seeing mental uh, or state mental hospitals closing and all of these individuals being sent back into the community. Um, of course, we understand now looking back that we didn't have the proper uh, programs in place to receive them, and that legacy unfortunately continues until today. Uh, this is a photo of Camarillo uh, State hospital. Um, I have an aerial view as well. Um, very typical for that era, these large kind of pastoral settings, large campuses uh, where we would place people with serious mental illness. Uh, it really got started in 55, and it had to do with clopromazine, which was the first antipsychotic that we had available that had been shown to be uh, effective. Um, but 10 years later, uh, the federal government passed the legislation that created both Medicare and Medicaid, and so that then really propagated or pushed forward this deinstitutionalization effort. And it consisted of really two parts. We were closing state hospitals and kicking people out, but also we were taking away from people with new onset serious illness a place to go for help. Um, 
Interestingly, 69 was also the year that the Lanterman Petrus Short Act became effective. And of course, we, un we now fully understand the impact that that law has had on the practice of psychiatry. And many of us on a regular basis are engaged with various aspects of this law and its requirements in terms of how we hospitalize patients, uh, particularly those who uh, may need involuntary care. Um, so treatment-wise, uh, we were really just getting off the ground. As you heard, uh, uh, Thorazine had come along um, as the first antipsychotic back in 1955. The antidepressants actually also began rolling out in the 1950s, and the very first antidepressant drugs were ipronizid, uh, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, uh, and also imipramine. Now, I don't know if Joel's with us this morning, but Joel Dimsdale, when I was working with him as a CL fellow years ago, had us all read a book called The Last Crusade. I see some nods. I think Kristen may have been given that book as well. But what's fascinating about that book is it talked about uh, our response to the tuberculo tuberculosis epidemic. But in the midst of the book, in the middle, there are a bunch of photographs. And there's a photograph taken from a sanatorium uh, in the 1950s of a group of women dancing. And it, and it was a photograph capturing the antidepressant effects of the uh, anti-tuberculous medicines that these women had been given. So it's interesting how uh, some of our most important drugs uh, came into being through these uh, unusual pathways. Um, the, the second tricyclic that we had was amitriptyline, which was approved by the FDA back in 61. Um, so uh, this is, I don't do math well, it's 18 years later, not 21 years later, but if we look from 69 forward, it was 18 years before uh, we had uh, this new category of antidepressants, the SSRIs. Uh, they had first been sold in Belgium back in 86. Um, our government, the FDA, approved them in 87, uh, and they began being marketed uh, the subsequent month. Uh, within a year, uh, the sales of Prozac uh, reached 350 million. And it really, as we all remember, had a tremendous impact on our society and our culture, and it spawned all this conversation. There were books written about Prozac. Some of you may have read Listening to Prozac. It really uh, influenced popular culture in a way that we would even see these types of cartoons where you can see this uh, really rowdy young guy uh, showing up at the neighbor's house asking if he can borrow a cup of Prozac for his mom. And based on what he looks like, I suspect she probably could really use some Prozac. Um, lithium had been around for a long time. It was actually first discovered to be helpful for uh, mania back in 1871. And others had um, experimented or, or trialed uh, lithium, including John Cade in 1949. Uh, there had been some actual uh, more systematic work done by Morgan's show uh, in the 50s, and it, during that period of work that he did, he became interested in the potential for lithium to actually be something that would be a prophylactic medication and prevent episodes of depressive illness. But it wasn't until 1970 that here in the United States, um, we became the 50th country to allow lithium sold as a treatment. So you can see that our colleagues practicing psychiatry and learning psychiatry back in 69, they had a couple of antipsychotics, they had a couple of tricyclics, uh, they had lithium as a tool that had just recently uh, come around. And then they also had ECT, and this is a photograph of what an ECT machine in the 1960s looked like. Um, what's significant about ECT in the 1960s to me is it was in the 1960s that we really got serious about doing research that demonstrated the benefits of ECT. And interestingly, it was the development of the antidepressants that kind of fed or spawned this research because a lot of the research then was set up so that ECT was compared against tricyclic antidepressants in terms of efficacy. And of course, as we all know, ECT consistently was shown to be m more effective uh, than any of the categories of antidepressants available at that time. In 1969, we didn't have physician extenders. Here's a cartoon with the receptionist telling the patient, the doctor's nurse's nurse practitioner will see you now. It's really curious to listen to my 90-year-old father talk about his physician extender. And he's, he's made that adaptation. And now he doesn't reference his primary care provider as the doctor anymore. It's his nurse, which is an interesting transition for him to have made. 
Well, what was going on here at um, UC San Diego in 1969? Well, the first group of, of folks that came here for residency training likely graduated from their medical school in 1969. Um, and so the first group of residents really in, got going in 1970 because for decades, as some of you recall, our residency program did not include an internship year. That was done separately and our trainees would come here as second year residents. And so our residents uh, got engaged in 1970. Our very first graduate was Mark Shuckett. And I know probably everyone in this room knows who Mark Shuckett is. And uh, so it's interesting that we had such a luminary uh, get us kicked off. What a nice beginning to our residency training experience. Uh, between 1973 and 1976, the size of our classes varied quite widely. And I, I'm not sure why that was, but the class size varied from nine all the way up to 17. It was a bountiful year, I guess, in terms of recruitment. Of course, we didn't have the residency matching program back then. But in addition to Mark Shuckett, I looked at some of the folks that were in those first few groups of classes that we graduated, and they're listed here. I've highlighted in bold that there were a couple of women in those first couple of classes, but also I think you'll recognize a lot of these names, Ken Curry, Don Kripke, Michael Newhouse, all of these folks have stayed in San Diego. Many of them have been a part of our faculty and a voluntary teaching capacity. Steve Gould, Leighton Huey, um, Ted Mons, Don Medario, Bruce Hubbard, I think Bruce is here in the audience with us this morning. Um, Hamp Atkinson, who I saw come in, was uh, in one of those early classes, wherever you are, Hamp. Uh, so some really impressive people, besides Mark, uh, uh, were a part of those early years of our residency training program. Altogether, we've had four residency program directors. Now, in the upper left corner, I don't know if I have a, a button here, but up here, this is not Marvin Carnow. Who knows who that is? I think Sid mentioned this. This is actually Joel Yeager. I unfortunately was unable to find a photo of Marvin, but he was our very first residency program director, and he was in that role from 1969 until 1972 when he moved to UCLA. And in this interim, while we were waiting for Bob Nemiroff to arrive, uh, what Joel explained to me yesterday was that he was kind of uh, a placeholder. He uh, kind of served on an interim capacity, but was really never officially a residency program director. Um, Bob Nemiroff, who you can see over here, uh, took over the residency program in 1972, and he served in that capacity until Sid stepped into that role in 1995. And Sid had been assisting Bob for a number of years as the associate program director starting in uh, 1981. And then in, in 2016, uh, Sid handed the baton uh, to Kristen Cadenhead. So here's Sid and Kristen. So where are we today in terms of our training efforts? Well, one innovation that came about when Igor became our chair is the establishment of a psychiatry education and training council. And that council has been headed by Neil Swerdlow and by Greg Light, who you see pictured in each corner of this slide. But in the past 50 years, we've grown from one residency training program for psychiatrists to 28 programs. We currently have about 355 trainees in various uh, training programs throughout our department. Um, we have graduated over the 50 years that we've been a psychiatry residency program, 557 psychiatrists. Not too shabby, pretty nice contribution, I think, to the world. Um, if we break down all those programs, we've got 10 research uh, fellowships, we've got 10 clinical fellowships, we have four residency programs, we have a PhD program, a psychology internship, two allied professional training programs, and of course a whole spectrum of educational programs that we provide to both UC San Diego medical students as well as medical students from other institutions across the country. So just to drive home how much we've grown, I thought this graphic would re be really helpful to see. And 
uh, it's very nicely color coded. I think the colors may be a little bit faint, but each uh, block of colors here represents a different portion of our educational and training effort. So down here at, in the kind of orange peach color, we have our uh, research fellowships, our clinical fellowships, our residency programs, um, our medical student uh, educational programs, and, and so on. So we have a lot of different uh, programs. And really, if you look at departments across the country, the amount of education and training that we do is in the very top tier in terms of volume and breadth of educational effort. And I think we should be really proud of that. I think there are other things that make me proud when I think about our educational effort, but Bill Perry and I were just having a conversation yesterday about one of the other really unique and wonderful aspects of our department, which is how we've integrated the disciplines of psychology and psychiatry. And we take that for granted. But trust me, those of you who travel around the country, I, I'm sure that you've encountered cultures much different than that. But I think our belief has been always that uh, this marriage is a win-win-win situation. Everyone comes out on top when we work together in such a wonderfully collaborative way with respect of each other's expertise. So what does Neil think our future will hold? I will tell you that this is, to me, a very eloquently written quote, uh, and so I'll just share it out loud. Uh, Neil, uh, when I asked him what his vision of our future was, he wrote back, the tripartite mission of the University of California is education, scholarly research, and service. In fulfilling this mission, we face shifting resources and priorities of a health system for which high volume clinical service delivery and profits are increasingly prioritized over education. Within this challenging dynamic, our efforts will be to serve as advocates for our trainees as they acquire the skills needed to advance science and medicine to better serve individuals and families with mental illness. Sounds pretty good to me. So um, I'm not sure, I didn't, uh, I guess I have about two and a half minutes or so, if this is correct. So I'm gonna whip through, take I'll take, thank you, how generous. Uh, I'm gonna whip through uh, some uh, lessons that we frequently teach uh, our trainees, just to kind of uh, sum things up. So one thing is there's no such thing as VIP medicine. Treat all patients with the same high quality that you would want a member of your family to receive. I think that's one of our golden rules. So whether you're treating Pinocchio, who's missing his strings, Santa Claus, who's worried about other people's happiness, Dracula, who's got low self-esteem problems, Humpty Dumpty, who may have PTSD from having fallen off that wall, a member of a big crime family, perhaps. And by the way, some of you may know that Enid Rockwell and I, in the, early, uh, the late 1990s, treated a very, very famous parent of a, well, I should say, a parent of a very, very famous crime mob leader. And I won't go into it in any more detail, except it was quite an interesting experience to see this well-known person showing up on our geriatric psychiatry unit when we were based at Thornton. Uh, <laughs> uh, or lastly, of course, if, even if you're treating Lassie, we, we treat all of our patients the same. Um, but we are also educating our learners about the challenges associated with insurance, which are to be expected, and I'm going to highlight some of those challenges, such as perhaps innovatively using those security checkpoints at the airport for diagnostic purposes. Um, listening to patients complain about their coverage. <laughs> um, listening to Humpty Dumpty uh, fret about the fact that all the King's men weren't approved by his HMO. <laughs> Dealing with the need for these second opinions that the HMOs often ask us to provide. A little editorialization here, I suppose. Um, we also teach about technology now, this is still a little dated. If you look at the, at the script at the bottom, we even use different shorthand now than when this cartoon was created, but this is therapy with texting. Um, someone wanting to be recognized for completing 8-Ball's third mission on Grand Theft Auto as a therapy goal in therapy. Mm. But some technology may actually not be uh, so uncomfortable. You know, some, sometimes technology may actually be useful for us. 
Cognitive therapy is an excellent tool, but it does have its limits. Here's a guy who's taking it to the nth degree at a cocktail party. He says, oh, I've had a few failures, followed by a string of successful marriages. That's really reframing, huh? Or that's your advice if I'm happy and I know it, clap my hands. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. It's been great starting the day. Just, we do have a couple minutes okay. uh, for a comment question, and we, we want to always try and include the audience as much as we can during the day. So any, any comments or questions, thoughts? So uh, you invited a comment, and um, first of all, uh, Dan, what a wonderful um, uh, trip through memory lane. As a child of the 1969, I really, uh, well, not a child of 69. I was already an adult, I think. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but still, uh, memories of that period are uh, so fresh in my mind, and it was wonderful that you uh, also led us through what's happened since, so thank you. Um, I do always, though, uh, because uh, I was trained by uh, uh, Tim Beck, uh, um, uh, would like to reframe the comment that you have uh, um, uh, shown from Neil Swerdlow. And Neil, I'm sure, I don't know if he's here, and he, he would appreciate this, because we always have this dialogue. Um, I don't agree that there is a, has to be a necessary tension between the training of physicians and psychiatrists and psychologists, uh, nurse practitioners in, in mental health, um, uh, between training and the delivery of service. In fact, uh, those need to be integral. Now, we need to recognize that the objectives of these things do have some differences. Of course they do. But what I would always hope for, and certainly it was the experience in my own training, is the intersection between education and clinical care. You cannot be trained as a physician without treating patients. And to treat patients, you have to spend time with them. Um, and I guess um, my soapbox is always that, you know, if you want kind of a very guaranteed nine to five job or whatever it is, don't be a physician. That's, that's not it. Uh, this is a 24 seven calling um, and uh, requires the work and so forth. So I actually mourn a little bit uh, the way education is being um, uh, kind of separated as a special thing with unions and all, all of these other kinds of things versus patient care. But I, I know I'm at an end of a continuum, but I thought it would be useful to at least put that perspective forward. And people can shout me down if they like. But I graduated in 77, and I'm closing my practice at the end of the year and trying to find psychiatrists to take my patients. And I've ex uh, most of my patients have been insurance patients over uh, my career. And I'm a child psychiatrist also. And I'm just struck by the lack of psychiatrists and child psychiatrists in numbers. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if the programs have any uh, plans to increase how many people they train, but it's uh, just breathtaking how many. I have patients who come in and they've called every person 70 people on the list of people that are on the panel of their insurance company and not one is accepting them. Hmm. C could you tell us your name just for those of us who haven't had a chance to meet you? I'm Brian Bruns. I'm oh, Brian, I didn't recognize you in the dark. Hi, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and so uh, I, I don't know if the national organization is really planning to increase. Well, child fellowships would be wonderful. And so if you give any information on that. Well, um, I will amplify, Brian, that um, there, there's a lot of data that shows that we are really, really behind in terms of the number of both child and adolescent psychiatrists as well as geriatric psychiatrists. But also, I think you could say that we actually don't have enough general adult psychiatrists either. Um, the good news I can share, and I may lean on Kristen here a little bit, but um, the good news is that for the past couple of residency recruitment years, there's been record numbers of applicants to the field of psychiatry. 
And I would like to think that that will translate into some of these uh, deficiencies being addressed. Kristen, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, that's that's right. And the only other thing, and Desiree may want to expand on this too, is I actually I think they're having some trouble filling all of the child psychiatry fellowship positions across the country. And I know there's a lot of discussion on the residency chat areas about why that is and if it might be related to um, you know just things like debt and wanting to get out sooner and I. I so Brian is sharing that he has a nephew that's acquired a debt of $450,000 in the process of becoming a physician. That's, that's mind-boggling. And just to speak to the child and adolescent psychiatry, this is Desiree Shapiro. So ACAP, the American Association for Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, they've been working on this for a while, and they've been trying to increase interest in the CAP fellowship. And Dr. Kane has absolutely correct, and Dr. Heineman could speak to this too. I think there was a, a number of 50% of the child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship slots that didn't match. Um, so it's really concerning, and there is national effort from ACAP, but, but I don't know on the ground why people aren't interested. I think it's an awesome <laughs> career path. Um, yeah, I, I need to walk away from the mic, but uh, Igor, I do want to amplify that um, we are in this together, and we do need each other, and I think if we do it wisely, it will be a win-win situation. I think the, the challenge we have, though, is making sure that each group has its opportunity to advocate for what is best for that group, and then we, we work towards compromise. But.